This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Leading us in worship today will be a wonderful ensemble of students from our Gloria Day Youth Choir who remind us of God's perfect wisdom. And then preparing our hearts for worship will be our string octet who usher in us into God's presence as we focus today on the one who is holy, holy, holy. Habakkuk 2.20 reminds us, the Lord, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Thank you to Pete Hazard and our string octet for leading us this morning in worship. Good morning. Welcome to Stonebriar. My name is Charlton Hyatt. I serve here on our staff as a pastor. And we're glad you have decided to join us here today, this morning, for our time of worshiping the Father together. Also, if you're joining us from um, live stream, we welcome you from wherever you're tuning in. Thank you for joining us also. Our senior pastor, Chuck Swindoll, and his wife, Cynthia, are enjoying some time of respite and relaxation this month. And of course, last month also, he'll be back with us in September. We look forward to him returning here. But Dr. Jonathan Murphy has been with us this month in a little bit of July. 
Jonathan is no stranger here at Stonebriar. He is uh, welcome, and we are so thankful for him and his ministry here. He also serves on the staff at Dallas Theological Seminary, where he chairs the pastoral ministries department. And he also serves on the preaching team at Christ Chapel in Fort Worth. He and his wife, Sarah Jane, are originally from Belfast, Northern Ireland, but make their home here in the Metroplex. And he and Sarah Jane and their kids are here with us this morning. So, Jonathan, thank you for being here. Would you join me in welcoming them? If you're visiting with us this morning, you're a special guest to us. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being here with us. There is a little card in the front in front of you. It's probably on the back of the seat. You can take a picture of that with your camera. It'll bring up a form for you. You can fill out about your visit with us today. But also, please, if you don't do that or if you do that, after the service is over, in our atrium, we have an information center, and um, we would love to get to know you, answer any questions you may have about Stonebriar. So if you'd make your way back there at the end of the service, we can help you and hopefully invite you back, and you will return to be with us again. Thank you for being here. This morning, of course, we will, as a family, enjoy a time around the Lord's table. We will have communion together. And when we do that, at the end of our services, we have a benevolence offering that we take up. We're so thankful for our benevolence ministry. They meet behind the scenes, often with those in our church and our community who've just fallen on hard times. We look for ways that we can help them, encourage them spiritually, in their relationship with Christ, invite them in. So when you give to that ministry, that goes to those needs here in our community and in our church. So at the end of the services today, our ushers will be at all the exits with baskets, then you can uh, contribute to that offering. Thank you so much for supporting that ministry, and of course, so many ministries have been going on for this summer, and especially one that is near and dear to our hearts is our backpack and school supplies ministry. As you see here, some of the 825 backpacks that we packed yesterday, you gave over 33,000 individual items over the last few weeks, and they all got together through our missional living ministry, and Keith, and Karen, and Susan, and Julie, and they all helped everyone to pack those backpacks. In fact, a team went out yesterday to our Hilltown community in Little Elm, had a time of just giving those backpacks out, praying over and visiting with the folks there, sharing the gospel with them. And we'll do the same with the rest of these in the colony, Little Elm, Frisco, and also in Dallas. So pray over these. We're gonna do that today, but you wanna continue to do that. And thank you again for your kindness and generosity in simply giving um, to the Lord and to others uh, in his name. Well, now's a good time for you to stand up and greet someone around you, say hello to them and welcome them this morning. Breathe. Hey, and thank you for moving around too and just going across the aisles and saying hello and uh, welcoming everyone here today. Well, we have much to praise the Lord for and we have on our Stonebriar Minute this morning just really some highlights of this past summer. 
of ministry both inside the walls and outside the walls of this church. Wherever the Lord has us, we want to be faithful stewards of those opportunities to fellowship together, but also to serve each other and serve others and take the gospel in word and deed outside the walls of this church. And so this is just really a highlight reel of some of the things that we have participated, that you've been a part of this summer. Thank you. And God is using that in the lives of our students to the lives of our senior adults and every generation. So thankful for his work here among us. So as you see these, let it be a praise. Uh, Just praise the Lord for his work through his people here and beyond us for his name. And it'll set our hearts uh, aright and ready to praise him after the Stonebrier Minute is over. into the heavenlies, John the Revelator testifies that the four living creatures proclaimed day and night, never ceasing, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come.
Aren't you grateful to be part of a church that's committed to raising up the future worship leaders of tomorrow? Thank you, Misty, and thank you, students, for, for yes. <laughs> for focusing towards the truths of God that we've just heard, that his ways are perfect, even through those, those hard times, those, those hard and challenging times, we learn to trust him most. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me as we continue in this time of worship? And I want us to consider these words together from Hebrews 4, these words that point us toward the very throne room of God, where Jesus serves as our intercessor, where he stands before the Father advocating and interceding for us. We read in Hebrews, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's a joy and privilege for me to read for us together the passage, the text that Jonathan is using for his message this morning from the book of Ruth as he guides us through that wonderful story of God's kindness and of Ruth. So if you have a copy of the scriptures with you, please turn to the book of Ruth. We'll be looking at chapter 2 today, verses 1 through 23. So Ruth 2, verses 1 through 23, if you have the scriptures with you, turn or go there now, please. Would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word? Now there was a woman herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. While she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? 
And the foreman replied, she is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She has been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. Boaz went over, to, went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go out to any other fields. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from this well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother in your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I am not one of your workers. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with his harvesters and gave, Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all that she wanted and still had some left over. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. So Ruth gathered barley there all day and when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. She carried it back into town and showed it to her mother-in-law. Ruth also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. Where did you gather all this grain today, Naomi asked. Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I work with today is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him, Naomi told her daughter-in-law. He is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. Then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with his harvesters until the entire harvest is completed. Good, Naomi exclaimed. Do as he said, my daughter. Stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you'll be safe with him. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer. And all the while she lived with her mother-in-law. May we receive the Lord's word and plant it in our hearts this day. Please be seated. Would you join me in praying to our Father? Father, not to us, but to you, to your name, all praise we give, all majesty and honor and adoration, for you are worthy. And Father, sitting above all the heavens, you look down to see us, and you love us, you listen to us, you show compassion and kindness, you demonstrate your love through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Even he left the Holy Spirit for us to help us. Father, what kindness, what generosity you have given to us. May we be instruments of that to all those you place before us, those in our families, those in our neighborhoods, wherever you have us, Father, that we may point to you and your goodness, your generosity. May we take all of the, the stuff of this world, the, the malice, the clamor, the anger, the filth, the talk that uh, does not honor you, may we put that off, put it aside, and put on Christ. And instead, Father, be kind, tender-hearted toward others, forgiving each other, 
and others, just as you have forgiven us everything in Christ. To that measure by which you love us, Father, you've called us to love each other. Help us to see that. Help us in our weakness to trust you in that and step into those opportunities all around us, Father, so that again, you may receive the praise, the glory, that Christ may be seen, he may be lifted up, he'll draw everyone to him. Thank you for how you love us. And so, Father, we offer this time today and we offer these backpacks, these gifts uh, to those as school begins this, this week and in the coming days. We pray for our children and pray for our students, those that will receive these packs and others here in our church and in our community and in uh, the joining communities. Lord, watch over them. Father, bless them, protect them, and lead them by your love. May they be instruments of love to one another. And so we also pray for all the schools that are starting, whether public or private or Christian, Lord, all these and those that serve in them, the teachers, the staff, the administrations, the principals, the, the coaches, all those that have a part in the schooling. Lord, would you watch over them? Would you strengthen and encourage them? It is a dark world. It is a difficult time by which they do this work. So Father, would you bless it and bless our children, our kids, and for our parents as they're praying for their kids and grandparents and relatives. Lord, we just bring this before you. Ask your good in it. Thank you that we can. Thank you that you've made the way as we've just proclaimed through Jesus Christ that we can confidently ask for your hand in all of these things. Father, to magnify your name, to lift up the name of Christ, and to let your love in Christ lead us that we may walk by it. So to that end, Father, guide us today. Be with your servant Jonathan as he comes to bring this message, Lord, and speak through him and through your word to our hearts that we would receive it and you would lead us by it. We love you. Increase our hearts to be better lovers of you and others around us. And Father, we pray all this as it would please you and in the matchless name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen.
Well, good morning. It is good to be with you once again. Uh, Please turn back to Ruth chapter 2. We're in this series uh, through this wonderful story, this wonderful book. Uh, God wrote it for his people 3,000 years ago with relevance for his people today. And so we'd like to explore some of the lessons that are there for his church, for us. Did you know that when this nation was birthed, it it also uh, entered into some very, very dark days um, very early on, right after the Revolutionary War, uh, dark days fell upon it also. Uh, and, and while the founding fathers and, and the people alive at the time um, got along and were excited, those days very quickly turned into a decade-long season of, what do we now do? What, what now? We've never been alone. We've never governed ourselves. Where where do we turn? What's the next step? And an 81-year-old man rose to address the delegates, the representatives there in Philadelphia, and he recommended that they do what they had done 10 years earlier during the war, which was simply this, turn to God. Turn back to God. Uh, Referring to God, this man, Benjamin Franklin, for those of you who are interested, he said this, have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I've lived a long time, 81 years, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? I love that. Franklin is correct. What now? God now. God again. You turn to him, you cannot move forward any day, be they dark or bright, without without God, without calling upon God, asking for his hand to be involved in the affairs of life. God does govern over the rise and fall of kingdoms and all the days in between those rises and falls. And God, that doesn't take away from his noticing every little bird that takes a wee tumble in every single backyard on the planet. What now? You turn... To God, you turned once and you returned to Him every single day. And as I thought about that, I'm thinking of Naomi and Ruth, of course, because they're in that what now state in life. Where do we turn now? What what do we do now? Uh, They've hit rock bottom. If you have been with us for the last few weeks and you've been in chapter 1 of Ruth, you'll have seen that that they have been emptied of life. Theirs hasn't just been a little tumble. Moab emptied them of everything that they valued in life. Uh, The fields of Moab didn't, didn't, didn't produce what they advertised. And so they make the, their, their way back to God down this wee straight and narrow road and into the fields of Bethlehem in chapter 2. And that's, a, that's an important shift in, in, in chapter 1 into chapter 2. It represents more than a, a geographical move. It's a spiritual move. It's a spiritual shift. They haven't just moved from a, a set of coordinates on a map to another set of coordinates on a map. They've moved from outside of God's will to inside of God's will, right where God wants them. And yet, the morning after they arrive in Bethlehem, they're still empty. Life's still hard. The prodigal Naomi returned to God. The the pagan Moabite Ruth was converted to God. They're inside of the sphere of God's specific kindness, the promised land, but life's still hard. What now? 
Well, chapter 2, I believe, helps us with that one. What now? If you've been tracking with me for the last few weeks, one of the things I've been trying to get you to see is that the, the book of Ruth is a story of God's kindness as it emerges in the twists and turns of everyday life. Regular comings and goings, God's kindness emerges in ordinary and subtle and, and simple ways. God God likes kindness, and, and kindness in people gets God's attention because it's, it's his trait to begin with. He's a kind God. Well, well, today we see God's kindness is not just mediated through, you know, the rain that fell on the fields, that broke the drought, that, that, that broke the famine, uh, and, and restocked the shelves of, of Bethlehem's Walmart. I mean, God visited his people. Uh, and he visited them in the fields with, with, with a harvest. But we see that God's kindness is more often than not mediated through people, through godly people, people who are available to channel it toward others. And, and that people can, and that people should be God's people. Today, the church well, I want to go back to Ruth 2 and, and, and tell you a little bit about what's going on in that story, but to focus attention primarily on an individual who we haven't met thus far in the story. We've met Naomi, we've met Ruth, and I'm going to say a few things about them, but I want to focus in on Boaz. Boaz becomes our, our, our how-to-live-in-dark-days role model in chapter 2 of Ruth, and I want to draw a lesson from him that you could hopefully apply to your lives. So let's look back there. Turn back to verse 1 and, and, and verse 2 there, and you'll remember Naomi and Ruth have, have walked back into Bethlehem at the end of chapter 1, and they are battered and bruised by life. And, and Naomi provides a, a, a semi-confused interpretation of her condition. Remember, she, she talks at the end of chapter 1 that she was Naomi, which means pleasant, but they should all refer to her as Mara, which means bitter. And, and, and it's how she sees what's happened to her life. And, and it, it, it's partly true that, that God has allowed that, and she believes that God directly caused it, but we don't know if he directly caused it. Nasty things happen when you remove yourself from the will of God. But she's back in the land, and, 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 and so don't call me Mara. I'm a different person. Don't call me Naomi. I'm a different person. Call me Mara. I'm bitter. And, and that's understandable. She lost her husband. She buried her two little boys that she birthed and reared to be young men. She buried them in Moab, and she left them there in graveyards. She's a, she's a broken woman, and so the, the name shift in her mind communicates her, her situation and her mood. And, and so when in verse 2, Ruth, Ruth sort of says, I, I'm going to go out and get some food, Naomi doesn't really lift her head from the pillow. She's, she says two words, go, daughter. That's it in, in the Hebrew. It's just, just go, daughter. I, I, I don't want to get out of bed today. I'm a broken woman. Life is dark even inside of the perimeter of Bethlehem for her. But, but Ruth's remarkable. You know, Ruth's in a tough spot too. You know, this is, this is a foreign land to her. And she lost the love of her life. And she waved goodbye to, to mom and dad, to neighbors, to culture, and she's embraced through faith a new God. But, but her life is empty, and she's now, as a foreigner, as a Moabite, in a land that is likely to be very, very unkind to her. She can't shake the, the label on her name, right? If you look at verse 2, it says, Ruth the Moabite the Moabite. Don't forget she's a Moabite. But I love what she does. She puts herself, I believe, in a position that, that gets God's attention to receive his, his favor, his kindness upon her life. Look at verse 2. She says, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after anyone in whose eyes I shall find favor. 
But I, I, I like what's going on there. Is she, is she being optimistic? Yes. Is she being overly optimistic? Perhaps. Don't forget we're living in an era that was described as the, the time when the judges ruled. This is, this is a nasty time period in, in, in Israel's history. One of the key words in, in, in the book of Judges that describes life at this time amongst God's people is that they do what's good in their own eyes. How on earth is she going to find someone's eyes that are going to grant her favor? when everybody seems to be doing what's right in their own eyes. There's a little bit of irony there that you're supposed to pick up with that little word use in, in Judges and Ruth. Now, there's a, there's a separate sermon there in verse 2. I, I haven't time to get into it, but for those of you who are interested, just write these things down. I believe that Ruth seeks the right permission from Naomi. She understands her, her role, uh, and she, she goes to the right place, a field of Bethlehem, not a street corner, not going to busk and put out a bowl and just try and get some help that way. I'm going to go and work. So she goes and engages in the right practice, hard work. Gleaning is hard work. And she goes for the right purpose. She wants to care for Naomi, her mother-in-law, whom she loves who she says she's going to cling to, and she's going to go where she goes, and she's ultimately going to die where she dies. She's embraced Naomi as, uh, as her family, and Naomi's God as her God. So she goes with the right purpose, and ultimately, I believe, with this beautiful little prayer in her heart, is there anyone out there who might look favorably upon us amongst God's people? Ruth doesn't just sit back and wallow. She gets up and she goes. Uh, Pastor Warren Wearsby uh, tells a story, and it helps me understand Ruth here, and I hope it helps you understand. He talks about being at a, at a prayer meeting, a, a prayer meeting for Youth for Christ, and, and they were gathered there, and they were praying, and they were asking that God would bless them, and they were asking that God would bless the ministry, and they were asking that God would bless the, those involved in the ministry. And at the end of their time, a man stood up, and he shifted their mindset a little bit. He prayed this, Lord, we've asked you to bless all these things, but please, Lord, would you make us blessable? Would you make us blessable? And I, I like that word. I, I don't know if it's a real word, <laughs> but, but it communicates, I think, what, what is going on here with Ruth. Ruth positions herself in, in, in a field where she can be blessable by God. She's walking with him. She's willing to work. She cares for her mother-in-law. And she says, I'm going to go out there and see what happens in the hands of God. She's a blessable lady. And God did bless her. God was kind to her. Look at verses 17 and 18. We read them earlier, but what you're going to read there as you glance down is that Ruth staggers home with a sack full of food, an ephah. We believe it's about 50 pounds worth of crop grain. That's, that's heavy. She's, you know, that, that's, that's, that's heavy stuff. And, and she has a to-go bag as well from her little dinner date, which we read about a little earlier. A little bit of extras left over from her uh, meal with, with Boaz, which she's taken back uh, to her mom. We believe that 50 pounds of food like that is probably equivalent to, to about a week or two of food for two people. She put herself in a position to be blessable inside of the fields of God's favor, inside of God's will, willing to work, willing to go, willing to care, and God showed up and God provided for her and for her mother-in-law. God in his grace does choose to reward blessable type people, people who submit themselves to his care and live responsibly, walk responsibly before God. But now we get to Boaz, and, and, and Boaz, in my opinion, is a, quite the focus of a chapter two. Uh, he's a new character that's introduced, and as I said earlier, he's uh, the, the role model for us in chapter two for life 
in dark days. Now, if you hear nothing uh, from me in the rest of the service today, I do want you to get this. This is what I'm driving after, that while Ruth positioned herself uh, to be blessable uh, by God, Boaz positioned himself to be useful to God, to be useful to God. He wants to be useful to God, and he positions his life in such a way that at every turn, he is useful to God. God wants useful followers. God God wants his people to be useful to him. For, for, For some mysterious reason, he has invited us to be a part of what he is doing in the world. And not just us as a community, but you as an individual. Boaz models for you used to God. It's what people, it's what God's people do in dark days. They they mediate God's kindness in a dark world. Yes, it's good to, to, to seek God's kindness, but but it's also good to be God's kindness to those around you. So let me show you that in the life of Boaz in, in the moments we have left. Right at the start in verse 1, if you look down at verse 1, we're conditioned to meet this man through the lens of him being a really good guy. Now, I, that, that's not that shocking to you and me because we're familiar with the story and because of the days in which we live. But if you were to just exit chapter 1 and enter into chapter 2, in that era where everybody does what's good in their own eyes, it's hard and it's shocking and it's ironic to find that here we have a guy who's good. And, and, and we're meant to enter into that chapter with that in mind. Look at verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband. A worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Right from the start, you're told he's a worthy man. That's a very important phrase. That's a way of of casting him into your attention. The word speaks of his wealth and his status. Yes, he can help. He has the means to help. But, But the word pushes more to emphasize his character, his godly character, that he, he should help. I mean, he's godly after all, isn't he? Do, do those who can help always help? Not always. But here we have a man who should. It's also quite interesting, and you can't escape this thought as you read verse 1, that he's plonked right in the middle of two mentions of Elimelech. One subtle, one direct. A relative of Naomi's husband, indirect way of saying Elimelech. A worthy man from the clan of Elimelech. Elimelech, bless his little dead heart in Moab, is brought back into the story as a contrast to Boaz. Boaz is what Elimelech was not. There's irony there. Boaz stayed in God's will when his relative Elimelech, my God is king, strayed from God's will. Boaz thrived in Bethlehem, became a prosperous man in Bethlehem, inside God's will. When Elimelech died seeking life outside of God's will. So so this relative of Elimelech didn't do what Elimelech did, and he's now into our story. And he probably attended the same little Sunday school kids' classes in Bethlehem Baptist Church growing up with his distant cousin. They, they both learned the same stuff, but they took different directions. And so we're introduced to a man in a very, very favorable light because he is your role model. He's my role model on how to live in dark days. So, so Ruth headed out, verse 3, to glean and just happens to be in the field of the one worthy man who owns fields. That's, that's, that's quite ironic and quite remarkable. She enters that good guy's sphere of influence, his business. Now, there's more than she just happened to land in there. We're going to revisit that in a few weeks' time. But, but there she is in the field of a good guy seeking favor of anyone who would grant her favor. And she's there to, to glean, that is to, to pick up the, the, the crops 
that the harvesters drop. To glean is to, to walk behind the harvesters. And when they drop stuff or leave stuff, it was uh, the, the gleaners right by God's word to be able to pick it up. God instructed his people that they are not to go back and pick up what they left because that doesn't belong to you anymore. That belongs to the vulnerable, to the orphan, to the widow, to the foreigner in need. You also read that they're not allowed to sort of harvest the edges of the field. God cares for everyone. And so God wants to provide for his vulnerable people. And so Ruth goes out to glean, to pick up some food, some scraps that is left behind by the harvesters. Look at verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And, and they answered, Well, the Lord bless you. It's, it's, it's beautiful. The, worst, the first words out of this man's mouth are, are, a, are a call of blessing upon his employees. In fact, the first word out of his mouth is God, Yahweh, the personal name of God. Remember, this is in a time when nobody looks to Yahweh. Nobody looks to God, and he comes into work. And his words are words of greeting to his people. And they love him. They, they respond right back with, and the Lord be with you. Boss uh, Boaz is, is a nice guy. He, he doesn't, because he's the boss, just, just ignore them and, and walk on by and, and head to his office hut, you know, his executive suite somewhere to look at some spreadsheets and make big decisions because he's the big boss. Like he's important and they're not. No. He, 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 he doesn't hurl a few grunts at them and, 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 and walk on by. No, he, he, he sees them. He sees them and he speaks to them and his words to them are kind. May the Lord bless you as you work in this field for me. Decent people are like that. Uh, worthy people are like that. They're naturally courteous. They're naturally friendly. They're in his field. That is his field. There's no doubt about it. But, but he understands that this field is the little sphere of influence that God has given me. And anybody who transits through that needs to be blessed by God through me. He's a worthy man. So Boaz is a decent person. He's friendly. He's respectable. Look at verse 5. Then he said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is that? It's, you know, he's, he's a farmer in one sense, and so he checks in with his foreman, and good business people do that, right? They're, they're alert, they're aware, they're attentive of what's happening in their business, including staff. And so he goes to his foreman and he says, who's that? Now, people try and make... Uh, more of this, I believe, than is there. This is not uh, an, an older man checking out the young ladies. This isn't, this isn't you know, the, the upperclassmen at college checking out the incoming French, freshman ladies on campus. Like, who's that? Yeah, this is exciting. That's not what's going on here. This man is genuinely interested in his staff, and she's not one of them. And so, who is she? And uh, the report comes back uh, from his foreman in verses 6 and 7 that, well, it's Ruth, the Moabite. You know, who came back with Naomi? And, and she's been working here all day, you know, or at least until you've arrived. She's been that hard at it. So he gets a little report on Ruth. Boaz is attentive uh, to, to what's going on there, and, and, and he notices her. But look what Boaz does in verse 8. He goes to Ruth. Again, he sees her, asks about her, speaks directly to her. He doesn't send the foreman. He goes directly himself. And he says, listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. I have charged the young men not to touch you. And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. 
What, what Boaz does here is he goes over and beyond what God expects from him according to what God has written in his word. Over and beyond was expected of this man. He basically says to her, you've entered into my field, my sphere of influence. And in this field, you've enough food to glean. So stay here. There's enough food for you here, so stick around here. In this field, you're going to be safe, and you're going to be unbothered. Nobody's going to mess with you, so stay here. And in this field, you can drink what the men draw out of the well, so stay here and enjoy uh, full access to the staff perks. This is a wonderful act of kindness because Boaz is a worthy man. He's a decent man who's attentive and caring because he knows God. In fact, Ruth in, in verse 10, she actually detects that Boaz is God's answer to her request for anyone in whose eyes I shall find favor. That was her request as she walked into that field that morning. And, and lo and behold, she has it. God's answered it for her. God has blessed her. But in verse 12, we read what, what is motivating Boaz. And I, and I love it. Why Boaz does what he does. He connects his kindness, his acts of kindness, as just an expression, as just a little channel of God's kindness to Ruth because Ruth turned to God. She turned away from Chemosh, remember the false god of the Moabites? And she turned to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And when that happens, you shifted condition. So look what Boaz says. He says this to Ruth, The Lord repay you for what you have done. Referring to all of chapter 1, what you have done. And a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz, Boaz understands God. He knows how God is. He knows how God operates. When, when no one looks to God, Boaz looks to God. This is a remarkable individual in a very dark day. He knows that those who tuck themselves in under God's care make themselves blessable by God, are blessed by God. God responds because God cares. So Boaz is decent and Boaz is attentive and Boaz is caring and Boaz is kind because Boaz knows God. If you know God, that's what you're like. That's proof of your intimacy with God. You see people through God's eyes and God's eyes look on people with kindness and favor, with a desire uh, to bless. But look at verse 14, because Boaz dials it up the kindness even more. He dials it up at dinner time. I mentioned this earlier, at dinner time, he, he publicly recognizes Ruth amongst all the staff, not just by getting her to stand up, but by calling her up to the executive's table for dinner. I mean, that's some recognition. And, and he provides her with some bread dipped in vinegar. Doesn't sound lovely to me. Absolutely disgusting in my mind. But it, it, it's, it's, it's like the nice catered lunch for the executives at the important table. And he brings her up and he allows her to eat. Nobody that day is going to mess with Ruth. Because Ruth's now been deemed to be a guest of Boaz. In fact, I find it, I find it lovely. You know, Ruth eats to satisfaction and then she takes that little to-go to bag of leftovers back to Naomi. But that's a remarkable act of kindness by Boaz. Boaz seems to have been attentive enough to know who that day didn't bring a packed lunch. Ruth has no food. She didn't open the fridge. Okay, what will I take home for lunch or take out to work for lunch today? No, she's sitting there hungry. And he knows it. It's, it's beautiful. Now, I thought the kindness was dialed up in verse 14. Look at verses 15 and 16. When she arose to go back to glean... Boaz instructed his young men, saying this, 
Let her glean even among the sheaves, among the sheaves, not behind, among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. So let her walk with you amongst the good stuff. And you keep your mouth shut. You don't send her back. Verse 16. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Basically, subtly drop some of the good stuff that you've already gathered so that she can pick it up as is her legal right without feeling like it's been charity. This is beautiful. Boaz's kindness is, is remarkable. He doesn't just want to give to her generously from the best stuff. He also wants to give to her anonymously so that he gets no credit, so that she maintains her dignity, so that there's no sense of, oh, well, yeah, I'm just a charity case here. It's beautiful. This is exceptional kindness, practical over and beyond kindness. He, he really is a worthy man. He's a worthy man. Now, that fact isn't lost uh, on our confused prodigal theologian, Naomi. Remember, she's understandably trying to figure out life uh, at home. But, but when she sees Ruth, you know, stumbling her way back with a 50 pound bag of food and a to-go box, she knows that something's happening here. God's up to something. Her heart begins to be stirred. Hope begins to rise. She must have lifted her head from the pillow when she saw that sight coming through whatever door and whatever place they're staying in. She detects that God's involved. And when she talks with Ruth and finds out it's Boaz, she says, Oh, he's a relative of Elimelech. In fact, in verse 20, you can read it there, he says, he is a kinsman redeemer. Now, I'm going to go back to that. Uh, the Hebrew word there is goel. Th that concept of a kinsman redeemer, huge, if you want to understand God's purposes in history through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is huge. But, but a goel, very basically speaking, is, is a relative that can help a family in need when they have a deceased uh, member of the family. So Naomi goes, oh, hang on a minute. This is interesting. You walked into that particular guy's field and he, a relative, a goel of ours, was kind to you? Something's happening here. God is up to something. You have to wait to chapter 3 and chapter 4 to figure out what that is. But all to say, and here's the point, and here's the lesson as we wrap it up. How do you live for God in difficult days this week, according to Ruth 2? What, what now? What do we do now? Well, you become useful to God. I told you that earlier. That's what Boaz models here. You become useful to God, particularly through acts of kindness. You determine whoever enters into your field of influence and in your sphere of life on a daily basis that, that you're going to be kind toward that person, that you're going to make yourself available so that, that, so that they experience a little bit of the loving kindness of the God that you claim to believe in and follow and submit to. You become useful to God. You live like Boaz models here, a decent, attentive, caring, godly, exceptionally over and beyond kind person. You busy yourself with kindness. What a wonderful way to spend your week. Busy trying to be kind to people because you want to channel it for God because God will work in those ordinary, subtle, simple little acts of kindness especially if you're not drawing attention to yourself like Boaz models here. You become a worthy man. You can help, and so you should help. So the question remains, are, are you positioning your life to be useful to God? Now, I know that you are collectively. Look at this here. 
There's a team here, a missional team, a living team here that is organizing attempts to try and bless this community to express the kindness of God and the love of God to this community. So corporately speaking, I know that this church has multiple opportunities to express God's kindness. The, these bags didn't, empty, uh, didn't fill themselves. These bags are not going to be delivered themselves. Uh, and these are just an entry point into a face-to-face -face relationship conversation with people who are living in darkness. And so collectively, I love that, that you're all involved in this. But the question is, are you personally? Personally, you. Not y'all, you. It's, it's maybe time to dial up the kindness personally. And, and Boaz models how for you, useful to God type of kindness is vocal. It's alert. It's attentive to, to those around you. It sees people. It speaks to people. Somebody's out walking the dog in your neighborhood and you walk past, say hello. Smile. The guy's cutting the grass in your yard. Perhaps wave at him. Smile. Be vocal. Be engaged. Useful kindness like what Boaz models here is practical and it's active. It will not stop with just well-wishing people along into their day. Oh, I hope it may be go, go well with you. They want to do well to people practically. You don't just wave at your yard guy. It's 100 degrees heat out there. You take him out a cold Coke or a Dr. Pepper or a glass of water. And that might lead to, a, how are you doing today? How's the family? You're active in your expression of kindness and practical. One of Boaz's descendants way down the line, a guy called James who wrote uh, part of the New Testament, he, he says it this way, faith without works is dead. And he's talking about the works of faith, right? You, you claim to have faith, but if you claim to have faith, why not back it up with wonderful acts of service to God and the people around you? Useful kindness is active and it's practical. Useful kindness gives. It is giving. Its, it's mindset is not what can I get from church, from those around me, from work, from my boss, from you. Useful kindness gives. Publicly and privately. Large and small. Friends, our time is up. You get the picture. In these dark and angry days in which we live, kindness is our light for Jesus in a dark society. You busy yourself with kindness toward others, and you will, God will, through you, change someone else's world. Now, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. The most remarkable expression of God's kindness on your life. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have entered into life with God, through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is your table. This is your opportunity once again to enjoy his kindness in light of what he has done in your life and look forward to the kindness that's coming our way. We get to celebrate together. The bread, of course, speaks of the body of Christ broken for you. The cup speaks of the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was poured out for the forgiveness of your sins how kind is that? We sang earlier about Christ being our high priest. He is our high priest today. But he was also the sacrifice that was put on the cross in your place. So I'm going to pray and, and, and then the servers are going to distribute the elements. I ask that you hold on to the elements when you serve them so that we can partake of them together uh, once I return after a little time of reflection. So this is your opportunity to reflect uh, personally, privately there with the Lord for what he has done. Father, we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ 
into the world, motivated by love, to restore us back to a relationship with you. And we know the book of Ruth has a role to play in that broader story of the gospel. But we're grateful to you. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we take this opportunity as a community of your people this morning in this little corner of the world, in this little backyard, to say thank you and to remember and to reflect. Meet with us now, we pray. Amen.
The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Father, we feasted at your word. We've remembered uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in partaking of the Lord's Supper together, we do proclaim our, our, our faith, our, our hope, our joy, our gratitude to you uh, until he returns. Lord, I pray your blessing upon your people this week. That just as we, as we have tasted of your kindness in Christ, that we would be channels of that to others in simple and yet in such important ways this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.